Now this is the 94th message in a series on the person and work of Christ, and our present subject generally is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as seen in the Old Testament scriptures. And as our key text for this general theme, you know we've been bringing to your remembrance Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised again the third day according to the scriptures. Now these are the Old Testament scriptures that Paul had reference to. And we are searching now for the mountain peaks of revelation in the Old Testament where Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection are seen through the eye of faith and the prophet's pen. We have some very precious passages yet to bring to your remembrance, and this one this morning, I'm sure, will be a wonderful blessing to you. In uh, writing to the Corinthian church again, in the second epistle, Paul made reference to Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us. And even though the Corinthians were Gentiles, Paul could not help in his writing to them to draw attention to the fact that what the Jews saw in the Passover lamb, we Gentiles see in the Lord Jesus Christ, God's true lamb. What the Jews experienced in the Passover sacrifice, we have experienced in the sacrifice of Christ. The Jews may have their Passover lamb and their Passover feast, and their Passover remembrance, but we who are Gentiles, saved by grace through faith in this wonderful Son of God, have Christ for our Passover. And we see in him, and we remember in him, what God did for his Old Testament people through that Passover. He has done for us Gentiles through another lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have established through this verse of Paul by the Holy Spirit, a true Old Testament picture of the cross and sacrificial work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you'll turn to Exodus 12, we'll talk about that Passover this morning. There are really two messages in the Passover for Christians, or that is for men. First of all, there is the message for sinners. And there is a message for the saints. This morning, contrary to the order that the religious world usually follows, we're going to preach to the sinners. You know, the Sunday morning message is always supposed to be to Christians. But I always found out there were more sinners present on Sunday morning <laughs> than there were on Sunday evening, because they scared all the sinners away on Sunday evening by announcing they were going to preach to sinners in the evening. So I'd like to switch it around and catch everybody by surprise. I'm going to preach to the sinners this morning, and we'll preach to the saints tonight. It'll be interesting to see who shows up this evening. <laughs> <laughs> so this morning's message, if you will please, in chapter 12 of Exodus, I'm going to read the first seven verses and then skip to the 12th and 13th. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth month, day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it, According to the number of the souls, every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goat, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the, of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Verse 12 reads, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. 
and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. God had his chosen people in the Old Testament. He had his nation. It was the nation of Israel. They were in Egypt's bondage 460-some years of it, working at the slime pits and under the lash of the taskmasters, terribly persecuted and afflicted, bitter in soul. They cried out and murmured day after day, praying unto God for deliverance. It seemed as though God would never hear them, or it seemed as though he didn't hear them. And after more than four centuries, God called a man. His name was Moses. In the backside of the desert at the burning bush, he revealed to Moses that even though the people had accused him of being deaf, he was not deaf. That's a wonderfully encouraging passage of Scripture. They thought just because he didn't answer them with a booming voice out of heaven, he hadn't heard them. But he reminded Moses that he had heard them from the very first day, mindful of their tear, concerned over their heartbreak. But God's timing is not our timing. And surely if we've learned anything in the school of experience, We've learned this. His ways are not our ways. They're so much above our thinking. Who can know? Who has counseled him? Who can explain or understand the way, the marvelous way in which God at a strategic time brings the all things together for our good and his glory? And he assured Israel that they had been left in the land for a reason. For God's ways are not capricious. They are not unreasonable. He does not sit in heaven and say, I'll do what I want to do, when I want to do it, whenever I feel like doing it. This is what people think, God thinks, about the affairs of their life. Oh, no. He works all things together for good in the lives of those who know him and love him. And we can't see the all things. We see the one thing in our life. And the all things escape us, but God sees them all. And he is working them together like a jigsaw puzzle in our lives for our good and his glory. We concentrate too much on the one great piece of that puzzle that is apparent to our eyes and is the center of our present situation or our present circumstances. But God sees the overall picture of our lives, the long look. And he's in no hurry. Neither does he deliberately delay. But he waits until there is that strategic moment when the all things fall together in place and the glory of God is demonstrated in the lives of his people and their hearts are filled with praise and with thanksgiving. And I suppose this is one of the harder lessons for the believer to learn is that we must learn to praise him when the all things are hidden from us, when we see only the small corner of this area of our lives. May God give us grace to understand and not become bitter and murmur against him because we cannot see that he is answering our prayer. God heard these dear people from the very beginning. He was moved and touched by their tears. He was concerned and compassionate. But he said he was dealing with the Amorites in the land of Israel, in the land of uh, Palestine. And he wanted to bring Israel into a land at the very moment that the cup of the Amorites' iniquities had been filled. For he brought Israel into the land at a time when he would use them to glorify himself in the lives of the Amorites. And don't ever forget that. That if there seems to be a long delay in the, in, in the answer of our prayer, if God doesn't seem to be doing anything in your life, it is because that when he does it, he will do it at such a strategic moment that he will glorify himself in your life as well as work in the lives of others so that none can deny that the hand of God hath done all of it. And so they were to be brought out, and Moses was his instrument. And Moses went down into the land with a commission from God to deliver these dear people from the hand of the world. They were in bondage like sinners are in bondage. And God promised a certain and sure judgment upon the land and upon the people who held them in bondage. 
Now for our perspective this morning from this great story. I'd like to begin actually in chapter 11 and in the first verse and read the message that God gave to the world through Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust out you out hence altogether. This is a rather frightening verse. I see in this verse this morning the pitting of the will of man against the will of God. Pharaoh was not only the ruler in Egypt. He happened to be ruler of the known world. He was a strong and powerful instrument on earth. Egypt was the prince of all the nations. Enlightened and intelligent, cultured, brilliant, the land of Egypt seemed to be the very seat of Satan's power. They had unusual wisdom and understanding and knowledge. All of it against the people of God and all of it against God, much like the world system today. Pharaoh was at the head of it. No one gave any orders to Pharaoh. When Moses came and announced that in his nation, under his bondage, there were those that God would set free, Pharaoh refused steadfastly to hear anything God had to say. And to put it in New Testament language, time and time again Moses preached the gospel to Pharaoh. Time and time again he came to Pharaoh with light. Time and time again he came with the word of God. And each time Moses came with light and truth. Each time he came bearing the message of God, he was turned away, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened against God. In all of these confrontations between Pharaoh and the Word of God, one thing became increasingly clear. The more Pharaoh heard the Word, the harder his heart became, and the more steadfast he became in his refusal to accept God's word. It is ever true in the life of a sinner. Do not mistake on this score. We feel that the best thing that can happen to an unsaved man is for him to fall into the sound of the word of God. But I repeat what I have told you many times before. It is the most serious and dangerous thing that can happen to an unsaved man. Once a man comes under the influence of the gospel of Christ, he is either brought slowly and surely and certainly to faith in the Lord Jesus and to salvation, or he is brought step by step nearer to a confirmed lost estate. He is, by the word of God, either softened and drawn to faith in Christ, or he is, by that same word, hardened unto an ultimate rejection. He is either enlightened more and more under each sound of the gospel, or he goes into deeper darkness under each presentation of the gospel. It is a sad but tragic truth that the gospel is a sharp, two-edged sword. One side wounds but heals. One side wounds and kills. Our hearing is either mixed with faith or is the very ground of our unbelief. The gospel message is the good news of our salvation or it is the proclamation of our condemnation. It is a one-way street. No man can hear Christ's gospel and turn away the same as before. No man can sit under the word and turn away from it and say that nothing has changed. All has been changed. For once light has been given to a man, he has been brought to the test of whether or not he loves his darkness rather than light, or whether he will receive with a ready heart 
the little light God has given him, that God might give him more. And so it was with Pharaoh, and so it will be with every unbeliever. There will be a time when God's long-suffering, God's patience, and God's mercy will come to an end. And he will say, as he said to Pharaoh, one more plague, and then Pharaoh will do what I have asked him to do. Then he shall do what I have begged him to do. Then he must do what I have pleaded with him through Moses to do. You see, God looks upon us as free in our choice, but there must come a time when our liberty and our freedom to choose must bow to the sovereignty of an almighty God. There must be a time when he will say, Now, since you would none of my counsel and laugh at my reproof, now your calamity must come. Now I must turn away as you have turned away. There is a time when God will say to the unsaved, one more plague, and then you will. You see, he comes through the word, and he pleads. And to me, this is a, an humbling truth about God. He pleads. The almighty God pleads with sinners. He stands in the person of his Son, and he says, Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He pleads that you would come, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets, and killest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered you, like a mother hen gathers her chick, but ye would not. And then there will be a day when instead of coming and pleading with the sinner, to receive his blessed Son, to rejoice in his love, to rest in his work, he will come and say, Now, one more plague, and then every knee will bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. And I repeat something, a phrase the Lord gave me early in my ministry, and it stayed with me. We must come to him now as our Savior, or we will be brought to him as our judge. We must receive him now as our blessed sacrifice and offering, as our Savior and our shepherd, or we will be brought to him as our God and our judge. For on the great white throne in Revelation, it is not angels that judge the world, nor is it God the Father, I've heard men foolishly say, I'll take my chances with God. I don't know about this Jesus. I'll take my chances in facing God on that day. The terrible miscalculation of such reasoning is that God judges no man. Jesus said he hath committed all judgment under the Son. It is the Son of God, the rejected Savior, who will be seated on the great white throne. It will be the wounded lamb that greets the unbeliever in that day. And perhaps he will say again, If ye have seen me, ye have seen the Father. I and my Father are one. Now, brethren, Pharaoh could have come. He could have believed. He could have fallen down and said, I recognize this God and I received from him his word. But instead he said, Who is the Lord that I should hear him, or that I should obey him? One more plague, God says. He didn't say this to Pharaoh. He said it to Moses. This was his word. The unbeliever might not know what he says in his word, but it is there just the same. And he says, One more plague. And he promises something. I will go out into the midst of Egypt. And the result of this personal visitation of God 
in death would be the judgment of the whole nation. And he promises that the result of this judgment will be a great cry throughout the whole land. And there will be none like it before and none like it afterwards. And it will be caused by the personal visitation of God himself in judgment. In this particular case, it was to be the death of the firstborn. He said it mattered not if it was the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat upon the throne or whether it was the firstborn of the maidservant that was behind the mill. All the firstborn of beasts also were to be included in his visitation of death. Here is a frightening truth about the coming judgment of God. It will be without respect of persons, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and God makes no difference between those who sit upon thrones or those who grind at the mill. He makes no difference even between beasts and men when the day of his wrath shall come. All of his creation shall feel when he shakes again heaven and earth in his wrath. <coughs> God has promised a personal visitation to this world. He visited them once in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, came into the human race by the very, very humbling manner of incarnation. This mighty God, able to dispense judgment with a word, took up his abode in a baby's body became fashioned like unto a man in outward appearances, that he might, through sharing the life of men, share with them the heart of God. He came to take upon himself their place of death, that he might bear upon their so his soul their cause of death. He came to be a sin bearer, entered the race to die, died at the cross, as their sacrifice and Savior, returned to the glory from whence he came, glorified with the glory that he had before the foundation of the world. But he promises, though he has pled for these 1900 years, and though he has come in the silken slippers of the Holy Spirit's ministry to the hearts of the unsaved, there will be a day when the hobnailed boots of his judgment shall be felt upon the race again. I believe that. The issue will be the same as it was in Egypt. And the results shall be the same. It will matter not in the day when he rises in his wrath whether a man is clothed in the silken robes of royalty or in the rags of poverty. It will matter not whether he be a beast of the field or a man of the race. It will matter not even the grass and the things of nature shall feel his wrath in that day. The sun will refuse to give its light. The moon shall turn to blood. And every mountain and island shall be shaken out of their place when God rises in his wrath, reeking with vengeance, with a holy determination to justify his righteous word because of the death of his blessed son. God promised Pharaoh. He promised in his word, there will be one more reckoning. There will be. All shall feel it. But in the midst of this promise of judgment, there was the message of grace. For in the midst of this promise of judgment, he says, But against, verse 7, Any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. The word difference in the original of the Hebrews is redemption. And God is saying this, Even though this judgment is sure, some may be saved, and there will be a difference in my dealing with those people, and the difference will be the redemption that I set between them and the rest of the world.
I've got a precious blessing out of this verse this morning. First, I found this word from the New Testament. How? Remember, Paul, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures? And here in the book of Exodus, God saying that we would see how he put redemption between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And the second blessing I got from this verse, I do believe in the second blessing, as you can see. The second blessing of this verse is this. This redemption, this salvation, this promised deliverance of some will be so complete, so faultless, so perfect, that not even a dog can move his tongue against that man. Now, you know, in uh, the New Testament, uh, Paul speaks of those who are dogs. He speaks of those of the concision as dogs, those who were religious, who had drawn near to God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. He referred specifically to the leaders of Israel, to the Pharisees and Sadducees of his time. And in the book of Revelation, John speaks of that day when the holy city, the new Jerusalem, shall receive the redeemed of God, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he speaks of those gates of the city, but he says, without, outside those gates will be gone. And then he describes the unbelievers. And you know the Jews themselves refer to the Gentiles as dogs. It's established in the New Testament that it was a spiritual term used to describe infidels, heathen, rejectors of God. It's a precious verse. Judgment will come. But not all will be judged. God's wrath will be poured out, but not all shall be under. Death will come, but not all will die. Damnation is certain, but some will be saved. And those who are saved, God will show in that day how he set redemption between them and the world. And it will be seen in that day, brethren, that our redemption is so complete, so perfect, so faultless, that no unbeliever in this world will ever raise his tongue in accusation against us. Two verses come to my mind that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world guilty before him. Another verse, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Now, now we go to the 12th chapter, and we learn about the redemption that he was to set between the saved and the unsaved. First of all, this salvation consisted of one simple thing. A substitutionary atonement, a lamb chosen by the people, accepted by the people, and killed in the place of the people. And in that atoning death, the people would trust, because God had given his word that by the blood of that substitute, he would pass over them in the time of his judgment. No accusations would be brought against him. No plague would come nigh them so to destroy them. And they would be saved and safe without even the smell of smoke upon their garments. To use another New Testament phrase. Didn't have anything to do with church. It didn't have anything to do with the way they lived. 
It didn't have anything to do particularly with those religious things that they believed. It had to do with this. Here is God's message. Another will die for you. Those who accept and trust in that substitute will be delivered in the day of my judgment, and I will look upon the blood of that sacrifice. And God will see in that blood whatever he must see to bypass in safety those who have rested in his shelter. Now, an interesting thing in verse 2, that's the general outline of it. In verse 2, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. When this incident took place, the month of Nisan, or April, they were far into the civil year. They had already torn off many, many pages if they'd have had calendars of their calendars. But suddenly God says that when this takes place in their life, it will be a brand new beginning. The past is as though it never existed. Their life starts that day, and a new beginning is made with God. And I wrote in my Bible one time, right by this verse, life begins at Calvary. When the sinner is brought to the Lamb of God, the past is forgotten. It is blotted out as though it never existed. No dates are recognized prior to that time. You say, now watch out, you're going to put yourself in the corner in a minute, because you're going to say, well, now what about the future? Well, I was going to say something about the future. <coughs> The past is blotted out. It is as though it never happened. No remembrance shall ever be made again of every day previous to Calvary. Well, what about the future day? Oh, there will be no future for you. Because he who comes to Calvary, remember Calvary is the place of the skull. Men who come to Calvary die. They never live again, only as they live in Christ. Think that over. I am crucified, Paul said, with Christ. Oh, you didn't know I died? Yes. I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He said that before some wise guy could say that you're living. He says, yes, nevertheless, I live, but not I that live. But Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I have by the faith, the faithfulness, the great says, of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you know what that verse means? It means that when a man believes in the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, God recognizes that he has that moment died and never shall live again in his own right. His life is ended. His history is finished. He came into this world by Adam. He leaves by the death of Calvary to rise in newness of life in Christ. And from that moment on, God sees him only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, he lives. He walks around in his body. So am I. But as far as God concerned, I died. I am dead and I am buried. Didn't he raise me? No, sir, he raised his son. And it so happens that I am in him, and I was raised in newness of life in him, seated with him in the heavenlies, accepted in him the beloved son, and God sees my history ended at the cross. My file has been closed forever. Every claim against me has been silenced. And every accusation has now been justified. I am dead. It is not I who live in the sight of God. It is Christ. No wonder we can say as long as he lives, I live. 
It is Christ who lives for us and Christ who lives in us. This is what the New Testament teaching is on the subject of Christ our righteousness. He said, when the Holy Spirit came into the world, he said he will convict men of sin, righteousness and judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father. You see? He becomes our life. He becomes our acceptance. He becomes our standing in the sight of God. Gone forever. Blotted out. <laughs> I like that. You look back over your life like a book with pages. And you wish that you could blot out some of them. You can't. You can't even blot them from your memory. You keep coming back like bad pennies and bad debts and bad friends. They keep coming back. But when a man comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, the very remembrance of what he was, the very remembrance of what he did, the very remembrance of his origin, Adam and death, is gone forever. God remembers no more against the believer their sins and their iniquities and their transgressions. And this is the state that David spoke of in his prophecy. When he seen it by faith, and he cried out, Oh, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, whose iniquities are covered. Blessed is that man, he cried, to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. No longer charge him with the sin that's doing. No longer reckon to his account his sins, his iniquities, and his transgressions. And if you have come to Calvary, and if I have come to Calvary, It is the beginning of time for us. Yea, it's something more than that. It's the beginning of eternity. Time has ended in Christ for us, and eternity has begun. You know, this is a blessed truth. We think of eternity out yonder after we die. Oh, no, we begun eternity in Christ. And you know, if we are in Christ, we have never really been out of him. He was slain from before the foundation of the world, and God has seen us in him all the time. This experience of being born of Adam, lost in sin, dead in trespasses, one day will seem like a bad dream. And throughout eternity we will rejoice. We have ever been in him by divine love and divine grace. So there was a new beginning. Life began when the Passover lamb was slain and when they entered into the safety and into the shelter of his blood. In verse 3, he speaks of the need of every man, every man a lamb. None could escape, only those who had a lamb would live. Doesn't say every man needed money or every man needed prestige. It was not the man needed something himself. All he need possess was a lamb. A lamb was enough. As long as that lamb could meet the qualifications that God now begins to give. First that lamb must be a male. That lamb must be unblemished. Notice and I just noticed this recently in studying ahead for these messages. I was stricken with this one uh, development that the, the lambs were always young lambs. Abel offered the firstling of his flock. Here it was the lamb of the first year. And you know, out of the 29 times in the book of Revelation, God refers to Christ as the Lamb of God, but he uses the term for lamb. It's not used any place else in the New Testament. John called him the Lamb of God, but he just called him a male sheep. That was the word John used. But when God describes it in the book of Revelation, 29 times he uses consistently one word which means 
a lambkin. A little, young, innocent, newborn, male lamb. I don't know what it means. I'm just telling you the problem. I don't have the answer. One thing it meant to me was that our Lord Jesus Christ was as innocent as a lambkin, as pure as a lambkin. Now, I've seen some old uh, uh, old sheep, old buck sheep, but uh, I wouldn't care to compare the Lord to them, would you? You ever get around an old buck sheep? Some of them have some of the nastiest disposition in the world. God never refers to him as an old buck sheep. He refers to him as a lambkin. You ever see a lambkin? Innocent, unblemished, tender, silent, submissive, willing. A lambkin provokes nothing but love for a man if I just look at it. They just want to pick that lambkin up and embrace it. I never felt like getting too cozy with an old buck sheep. But how about that lambkin? Twenty-nine times. I just bring this to your attention. I notice here again in this passage. A male of the first year. Unblemished. Which meant he must be without spot. He must be pure. He must be holy. And then he must be kept up for a season. And then sacrificed. Now, I've often thought up to, upon this keeping up as that time of his life, those first 30 years, where he was displayed to the nation in a way. No, he was kept in the background until that 30th year when he was manifest to the nation. Now, I used to think this really was a fulfillment. You know, this morning I see something a little uh, more important than that. Peter, in his first epistle, speaks of the Lord Jesus as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world in this way. He says, but with the precious blood of a lamb. And then he goes on to explain that this precious lamb who shed his precious blood was not revealed until now for us. And I thought of how God had kept him up from an eternity past for an eternity before Calvary, he was the unblemished, faultless Son of God, his beloved, darling Son, in which for an eternity he had found no blemish. And I know this is the true interpretation because God must declare him unblemished, not man. And God saw in him his own unblemished nature, for he was indeed his only begotten son. Then he was revealed to the people, and he was revealed on the eve of his death. For Bethlehem could well, in the scheme of eternity, be seen as the eve of his death. Revealed, angels looked upon him and found no fault with him. Thirty-three years, even men looked upon him. And though they despised and rejected him, he could say, Which one of you convicteth me of sin? No fault and no blemish was ever laid to his charge. He is described by the Holy Ghost as holy, sinless, harmless, undefiled, and above all, the friend of sinners. Then the unblemished lamb was to be killed. For we believers understand that there was no redemptive power in his life. We were not redeemed by his good works. We were not redeemed by his good words. We were not redeemed by his sinless life. We were redeemed by his sacrificial death. We were redeemed in the exchange of Calvary. Once a man wrote a bitter a donatory article upon the subject of the religious world's uh, mercantile view of the cross of Calvary. 
and he ridiculed the idea of substitutionary atonement in saying, why, it's nothing more than a market transaction. And that's precisely, bless your hearts, the way God seeks to describe it in the New Testament. He gave his soul a ransom for many. Men were in bondage and they must be bought back. And there was a price. And the wages of their sin was death and the price of their release was the incorruptible precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and he paid it. And the transaction was complete and satisfactory to God and it was finished. And we are the blessed beneficiaries of it all. So, the Lamb must be slain. We're not redeemed with his life, his words, his love, his disposition, his character, his way, his teaching. We're redeemed with his blood. We're redeemed by his blood. We're redeemed through his blood. We're redeemed because he died. And those who believe in the Lamb must be willing to kill him. You say, kill him again? We must be willing to personally identify ourselves with his death. We must be willing to take him not as Christ the teacher, not as Christ the example, not as Christ the Nazarene, or Christ the carpenter's son, or Christ the philosopher, or Christ the master. We come to him as Christ, the dead, buried, and risen Savior. We come to him as the sacrifice. We come to him as the offering. We come to him as those Israelites of old came to God at the door of the tabernacle and brought their substitute offering in their hands bringing nothing more and nothing less than one to die in their place instead. So we come, just as I am without one plea, but this, that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. And the Israelite must be willing to kill that lamb, take full responsibility for his death, identify himself in the shedding of his blood, and then he must take that precious blood and uh, strike it on the doorpost and little of his house. And when judgment comes and God visits, he said, I will see the blood and I will pass over you. Now, brethren, the word take is a key word. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. What's so important about the word take? It means to personally appropriate. Take for yourself. No Israelite would have taken that blood personally appropriated unless he believed God's word about it. Not only that, a man may believe with his head that the blood is precious. He may believe with his head that Christ shed that blood for sinners. He can believe with his head that God will pass over him if he takes that blood. But that doesn't really mean he takes it. It just means he believes all those things are true about it. What is important is that he believe in his heart that it is true about him. Supposing here's an Israelite who hears this gospel at the mouth of Moses. Kill the lamb. Take the blood of that unblemished sacrifice. Post it on your door. And God will pass over you. And so let's say that this Israelite with a head knowledge of the gospel he heard takes his lamb. And he kills that lamb. He says, yes, I will identify myself with its death. And he kills that lamb, and he catches that blood in the basin, and he brings it home. And he sits it up and looks at it. And says, of course I believe in the blood. Of course I believe that sacrifice died. And of course I believe that God will pass over anybody who takes the blood. But unless he takes it, 
and post it where God said to post it, in the manner God said post it, where God can see it, he will perish, though that blood be in the basin of his mind. I, I don't know whether that's clear to you, but there is a difference between taking the blood and just simply having an intellectual knowledge of the blood. It's kind of like a man standing by an airplane about to take off, and he says to the crew members, is that a good airplane? Well, it's the final. Is it in good shape? It's in perfect shape. Is it airworthy? We guarantee it to be airworthy. Would it take me from here to California? Without fail, it will take you from here to California. So I say to him, I believe in your airplane. And then he says, do you really? Will you get aboard it? That's something else, isn't it? It's one thing to stand while they rev up those engines and watch it go down the runway and say, I believe in that airplane. It's something else to be sitting there saying, I not only believe in it, I have perfect peace about being aboard it. Something to stand by the cross and say, I believe in the cross. I believe God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should perish should not, or whoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I want to tell you this, and though it may sound sacrilegious to you, I say it anyway, that there are many religious people who repeat that verse of Scripture like the Roman Catholics say in their Hail Mary. They stand to the cross and say, I believe God loved the world. I believe Christ died on the cross for our sins. I believe he was buried. I believe he was raised again. As a man just told me recently, I believe all that stuff in the Apostles' Creed. I say it every Sunday morning. They believe it. It's fact. Their mind lays hold of it. Too many people have believed it in the centuries past for them to stand up and call thousands, yea, millions, liars. And so they say, I believe it. Yes, God loved the world. Yes, Christ died for sinners. Yes, his blood is effective. Yes, his blood will take you to heaven. That's one thing. It's something else to know in your heart that not only these things are so, we have boarded that airplane. We have committed our souls to it. We have entered into it by such personal appropriation that we gladly trust the destiny of our eternal soul to it in the confidence and in the peace that it will not fail. That's something else. But saving faith. And men either have it or they don't have it, and men who have it no, they have it, and men who don't have it have nothing but a mere intellectual religion. There is peace by that blood, brethren. We rest in it or we don't. There is no such thing as a man saying with his mouth, I rest in the finished work of Christ while his heart is filled with unrest. There is no such thing as a man saying, I believe in the power of that blood, but I think that we should do this and do that, believe this and believe that, and that will also help. We either believe in the sufficiency of the blood alone, or we don't believe at all. Man can't believe in that airplane and leave one foot on the ground. He can't do like that little old lady on her first flight and say, I believe in your airplane, but I'm not going to put all my weight down. We either believe in it with all we have and all we are, but we don't believe at all. There is no middle ground for faith. We have this ridiculous idea in the world today that some have more faith and some have less. Some have a little faith and some have great faith. We either have faith, period, in the word of God in regards to the blood of Christ or we don't have any faith at all. Do you know how much faith it would take to save you? All the faith in the world couldn't save you. A man isn't saved by faith. He's saved by grace through faith. How much faith will it take to bring that gracious salvation of God through the blood? Just enough. One spark is enough. Just enough to say, Here I rest forever viewing. Mercy in drops of blood. Here my precious soul be doing. Is and it buys for me my peace with God. It's when we say, and I can't help it that I repeat this so much, it's only because I believe it. 
This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. How would you like for a man to get in that airplane and say, I believe, but I brought a parachute and flares just in case. I believe that this airplane is airworthy. It will never crash. Nothing will ever happen to it. But if it does, I will be prepared to bail out, set up my flares, open my sea rations, and wait for rescue. Which means that his ultimate hope is not in the airplane at all. His ultimate hope is in someone else's rescue and in his own provision. The religious world is overpopulated with men and women who have that kind of religion. They say every Sunday morning, in effect, in their songs and in their repetition of their creeds and dogmas, I believe that God loved the world, that Christ died for sinners, that the blood is sufficient. They come to the communion table once a month, once a quarter, once a week. Whenever they come and they take the cup and they eat the bread and they say that they believe that this blood and body is sufficient. But they bring the parachute of water baptism with them. They bring the parachute of church membership with them. And they say, I believe in the blood, but if it doesn't happen to be enough, I can still bail out on my merit, still stand on my morality, still clothe myself in my self-righteousness. I will still have an ace in the hole. No. Saving faith, brethren, is when we have burned every bridge of self-righteousness behind us, when by the Holy Spirit's grace and mercy we can look back no more and we say, here is where I rest. If I perish, I perish. But God help me, I stand on your word. You say you are satisfied with Christ. I am satisfied with him. You say his blood is enough. His blood is enough for me. You say I will not perish if I hide beneath its shelter. I rest here and I have that assurance and peace that I will not perish. No plague shall ever destroy me. For the very word of God itself is my guarantee. Now, we didn't get as far as I'd like to have gotten this morning, and I'm satisfied we got just as far as we were supposed to go. Tonight, the subject will still be for sinning, and we will preach on the blood that was posted on that door. What man saw in it, what God sees in it, and what there is by it for every believing heart. Let us pray. Father, this morning, we thank you that you have made your word plain. We see in thy blessed word that the saving power of your gospel and of your Son and of his blood must be appropriated. Father, pray that the Holy Spirit will make this message plain point out the difference between a head faith and a heart faith. We know that you've already done this. We thank you for it. We just thank you that you've done what you wanted to do, and you will continue to do this day in our hearts what you desire to do. All we can do is thank you again, Father, for your grace. Oh, how precious that grace is this morning. How real and precious thy word is. How sufficient thy son is. And how we know again this morning that the love of our hearts for Jesus and for thee is of your doing, not ours. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.